Oho. You're listening to Oilers Nation Radio, presented by the Nation Network. Oh, buddy. We're getting heavy today. <laughs> oh, yeah. Jared, what do we got today? We got Tyrant Spoils of Decimation. Tyrant Spoils yeah. of Decimation. Local, Local band. band. Yeah. Wow. Good guys. Uh, one of the guys. They're uh, heavy, boy. The, the lead singer of this band is the drummer for Ray Gun Cowboys. Okay. Buddy of mine, Throw Brett. back. Oh, Throw yeah. him back a couple weeks ago. Ray Gun Cowboys. Tyrant. Yep. Man, got to love that double kick drum. I love that double kick drum. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to episode 24 of Oilers Nation Radio. Today is a special episode. We've got a big guest, a big phone interview coming up with a guy that has spent 114 and played 114 NHL games. He's played all over the world. He's played in many different countries. He is a former first round pick of the Edmonton Oilers, 25th overall in 2004. You know him, the sweet hands, the sweet dangles, the one and only Rob Shrimp. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to episode 24 of Oilers Nation Radio. Today, we've got a very special guest with us on the podcast over the phone. You'll remember him. He was a 25th overall pick from the 2004 draft. Mr. Rob Schremp, thanks for being here with us today. Hey, guys. How you doing? Thanks for having me on. Appreciate having your time. Um... I know that you you've retired from hockey recently, and we were curious. I wanted to start things off by talking to you about what you're up to now. Awesome, yeah. So I'm working with the cannabis oil company, CBD oil company, named Veda Sport is our sport line. Um, and it's uh, as I was leaving the game, um, a lot. Of, I had to take a lot of things to kind of stay at the level I, I needed to compete, which is sleeping pills, anti-inflammatories, uh, pain medicines, a lot of these things, muscle relaxers. Um, I just found that it was, it was kind of excessive in some point. Um, and really, what, I know, as I left, I needed to use this CBD oil. I had some issues with anxiety and stuff. So I started taking this oil, and it really had a huge impact on my life. Um, really believed it. I mean, as an athlete, we get a lot of those products brought to us. As soon as someone makes a product, they usually bring it to the pro athlete. So, I mean, I, we've all had plenty of... Uh, research and development with certain things. And this thing really actually helped with my anxiety a lot in my sleeping issues. So, uh, for say last year, I took sleeping pills for like six months straight. I just couldn't sleep without it. Uh, got kind of hooked on it. And then now I haven't, I said, I've been taking CBD or I haven't taken a sleeping pill in, in almost a year. So it's just really helped me get off of certain things and get balanced out my life. So that's where I'm at with this company, trying to spread the word and help guys, uh, grab a hold of something a little bit more natural, more positive than, you know, the normal uh, sleepers and opioids. So uh, that's my mission right now, and that's what I'm looking forward to in the future with my life. Uh, what, what kind of challenges are you facing with this new project? Is it a matter of just kind of getting people on board with a new way of thinking, or, or, or what challenges are you facing right now with this? Yeah, so it's just an educational process with maybe a little bit of older generation where everybody kind of thinks it's uh, um, getting stoned per se or, you know, the words they use with marijuana, you're stoned or you're getting high. Uh, CBD oil is exactly not getting high at all. Um, there's no THC, and then and the one brought, the one that has a little bit of THC that's literally such a small amount, that, but it's so necessary for the cannabinoids to, to be transferred. So it's like very, it needs to be in there, but you would never get, you couldn't get high off it. I don't, you know, it make it, it take a massive amount too. So um, our stigma is really to get to get rid of that stigma. Um, you got to get rid of the, it's the educational process right now. Uh, but we sponsor the National Women's Hockey League, so we have Olympic athletes and professional women athletes taking our product and really having uh, some great benefits. So it's it, we're kind of building pretty good here. It's just a matter of educating, trying to get it to the right people, and uh, you know, really send the message of, like I said, I played last year, so I really still understand what it takes to be a pro hockey player. I saw, you know, sleeping pills are really prominent. It's just they are. Unfortunately, it's a sticky conversation, but. Um, if you can find something that's more sustainable and has the same, you know, impact that helps you get to bed and get you rested so you can be a pro athlete, it's probably better to go the sustainable, you know, natural way. That's my opinion anyways. I mean, some people might say, screw you, I'm going to take sleepers anyways, but that's, you know, as long as I can educate them and give them that stuff, we have a cool product. Um, really cool company. Marvin Degon is on board with our company. He played 10 years pro and his wife is the founder of the company, Karen Burke. So these people are, are trying to change the world in a really cool way. And I've jumped on that board and that mission and trying to help the, help the people. 
Rob, are you happy with the speed of the process of educating players and former players about CBD oils um, and other products? Or you think we're a, we're a long way from bringing it like 100% into the game and, and the athletes? Or where do you think we are with that? Say that again. I'm sorry. I couldn't really hear you clearly. Do you think, uh, do you think we're moving quickly to educating all of the players and former athletes about CBD oils and other products like that? Or do you think there, there are still a lot of roadblocks to beat? Um, I think it's moved, the, the, the momentum is moving on its own, so it's education is coming at free, uh, per se. I think it's just a big message now. Um, and I, think the, I think the opioids have become such a message now that nobody can be deaf to it. Uh, it's a very, you know, it's, it, hit, it, hit, it hits close to too many people's homes. My dad has had a bad back for 25 years, so he's been on opioids for a long time. I really, he's had such a positive reaction to CBD oil. Um, the opioids are screaming it, right? So, they need help. People are very getting addicted. There's a lot of heroin problems. Uh, so there's a new, the population needs something to help it, you know, and that's really where we're trying to come in. And I'm not saying that we can take away all that, but if there's, like I'm saying, certain things like sleep pills, pain medicines, if you can have something else, alternative, an option, um, it's, I think the education's coming there. It really is. People really understand it now um, just because of the opioids. That's my opinion. Rob, one thing that you've uh, talked about since you retired and one thing you've advocated about a lot is the awareness of uh, mental health among uh, professional players. How big is the difference now in regards to the stigma around mental health than it was when you turned pro back in the mid-2000s? It's coming a long way, but it's also a long way. Like, you know, I think, I think, uh, you know, my scenario alone, I, I didn't get to, unfortunately, get signed to another contract because I took antidepressants. Um, that's, I don't want to divulge too much of that story. It's still a little raw. But because I finally came out and, I mean, I got, I was diagnosed with high anxiety and depression. I've had depression since I was a kid. I mean, I've had some pretty extreme situations. I understand depression. I've had it for a long time. But, um kind of got pushed out and so that happened in a really raw I mean that's today's age so if that's still kind of going on then I guess I really looked at it and I said that's enough of hockey maybe I should go on a path of figuring out how to help this not be that way um that's where I'm at now and we'll see what happens what comes up but like I said that foundation is very important I mean I want to kind of reach out to other guys and if they're going through what I was going through or you know see if we can find some help for them um some balance per se and that's what I found with Vader. I had depression issues, and I just I found that I had when I started taking it on a daily basis. I felt like I was I had way more happy days and way more balanced days than I did about thinking about you know not being around anymore. So I really believe in the stuff a lot. I mean, it helped me a ton. So I want to take that. And if there's people with mental health issues that can't get you know some help here, some balance. Uh, I keep saying that word, but that word is really what I feel. I feel balanced out from what I used to go through. Um, so. And I'm trying to get, you know, the other thing is if I don't have, they can do that naturally. That's the most important thing. And that's what I, I have found. I've taken all the medicines. I took Xanax so I can take care of my anxiety, uh, antidepressants, and these kind of things. You know, so I understand all the medicines. So that's the thing unique for me as well. It's kind of a test study. I, I took all the stuff and realized what their powers are and what their, you know, pros and cons are. Um, and I'm also on a natural product that's like, it's taking all that stuff away. So it's, it's really powerful to me. What do you think that the, just the everyday public can do to kind of help further the conversation, Rob? I think it's like we talk a lot about Bell Let's Talk Day, but the unfortunate part yeah. is that's only one day of the year. And there's obviously a lot more that we can be doing day to day. What do you think that just, you know, a guy like me or Cam or Chris sitting around that, what can we do to further the conversation? I'm not really sure, to be honest with you. I, I'm kind of just, I, I got. I just got my uh, confidence to speak about this literally in the last like eight months as, as somebody had started talking about my issues for me. Um, that really made me upset. So now what I've done is like, screw it. I'll finally admit it. When I first got diagnosed with depression, I literally, the first thing I said, I don't know why, but I reacted to this way. I said, please don't say anything to anybody. <laughs> I don't know why. It was just like, I was so embarrassed, but like, why? I don't know. I had to tell the doctor, like, please don't say anything. I don't know why that stigma is. And then I knew, like, if I had to take an antidepressant, if people would hear that, like, 
I didn't want, I don't want the sympathy and I don't want the attention. I don't, I really don't. I don't need people coming up and they hear that I take an antidepressant. They're like, you know, are you okay, buddy? Or like the other side of it, like, am I crazy? And you know what I mean? It's just an attention that's, that's weird attention. Nobody knows how to handle it. So I don't know. I just, for me being, having this issue, I, I'm no different. I just have, there's some days that I have a struggle and I deal with it. You would never even know. But there's some days you act, you know, like I'm obviously fighting, fighting that battle. I'm probably not going to be the same person as when you saw me the day before. You know what I mean? Like the day before, I was happy as hell. I wanted, I loved everything. But when you have depression, it comes over, you have no control over them anymore. So you now you're fighting your own demon. You might seem like grumpy, like it's kind of a dick. But like people don't know what's really bad on, you know? So it's important. Now I've realized that it's important to be open about it because you may have, might have no idea why I'm being such a dick today. <laughs> You know, and it's not fair for me to expect that for people around me. So I need to be more open and just say, sorry, guys, like, you know, I have bad days. I hope you can accept it. But if you can't, then I guess I'll just try to stay away, right? Like, okay, then what else can you do? But if you're open about it, at least people can respect it and look at it. Yeah, that makes sense. That's that's interesting like, to hear. I don't know. I'm just kind of freewheeling. I, like I said, I'm just new to being okay with saying I have to try. I really am. Just someone else started talking about it, so I was like, Screw it. If they're going to talk about it, I might as well. So mm-hmm. here I am. Going to advocate for it and see what I can do to help that community and also maybe learn more about myself in some sense. No, that's awesome that you're doing that and it's, it's good to hear your thoughts and opinions on it. Um, you played quite a few seasons overseas in Europe and the KHL. Uh, my question for you is, is uh, did you notice a significant uh, different kinds of pressure playing in North America compared to Europe? in the European leagues? Um, I, yeah, they're definitely different pressures, but they're not, I, I'd say the amount of pressure is not much different. As far as like the, the, diff- the cycle, diff- different pressure points, right? Like over here, you're kind of threatened with, you're get sent down to the minors or, you know, there's the next guy biting at your heels where over there, you're like, if I don't score, they're going to fire me. Um, different pressures. But like I said, they're both heavy pressures and like, you know, that's a, tough load to carry for both sides but they're just different pressures so looking at your hockey db page you played in a lot of different countries a lot of different teams a lot of different leagues and i'm wondering if there was ever just a time where you could just sit and relax and enjoy the experience of what was happening or was it always a lot of pressure because you were always trying to keep a gig trying to fight for the next gig yeah no i i literally honestly it's it's not just your question's a little bit tough to say there's no positive. There's a, not that you said it like that, but like there's a lot of positives out of it. But I mean, like you asked, I didn't get to relax for like a decade. For 10 years, I had to fight every summer and worry about training camp and worry about actually finding my, or like first impression. In Europe, it was about first impression. It was no longer like worrying about training camp, but then I had to worry about first impressions. For like five years in a row, I had to make first impressions on everybody. I'm like, and then for some reason, like, you know, it just always floated around. I had this horrible attitude in hockey, so that just kept floating around. I, I got to, like, two or three different teams where, like, a month into the season, the guys was like, oh, a shrimp, you're not a dick. You're just, like, stiffler. Or, like, you're just, like, funny. I'm like, yeah. I didn't realize I was a dick, but... <laughs> <I was> like, <laughs> okay. But, like, you know what I mean? Like, I had already had a pre... pre exist whatever. Like, I just... They already had an opinion, so... I was. I just felt like I was. Every time I felt like I was fighting against it, every every new place I went, it just sucked. I'm like, why am I like always defending my character of some sort? I'm like, it was frustrating. So I didn't really enjoy. No, I didn't really enjoy it because it wasn't. I just didn't get to be myself. I had to feel like I had to put on some show because people thought I was such a shithead. Of all the places you played in your career, I guess you kind of touched on it a little bit when you said it was a struggle that decade, bouncing around from team to team, but. Where would you say your best memories are rooted playing hockey? Definitely London, Ontario. I mean, it was sick. We had so much fun. We just really, it just all clicked. You know, we had such great, great hockey. Great hockey. Like, we just, every night was so much fun. Hockey, like, we played well together. You know, just hockey. Whenever hockey's going well in my life, is I'm the happiest. And that was the happiest because we won all the time and hockey was sick. Um, what, a, what a team. And three years of it, too. I mean, First year I got there, I, I wasn't in the greatest grace with the coaching staff. I had to earn my spot. So, but that we still only lost. I think it was the first year I was there, we lost fourteen games. The second year I was there, we lost five games the whole year, and then two in playoffs, so seven total. Then the third year I was there, we lost eleven games total. So, 
lot of winning and a lot of fun. We hear a lot about like right now the Oilers have Evan Bouchard in London and we hear about how the London Knights are a culture of professionalism. What is it about that junior organization that helps churn out so many players? They just teach you how to win. It's like everything's to win. It doesn't matter. It don't get in the way of them trying to win. Like you said, you're either on the ship or you're, on, you're in the way. Get out of the way. That's how you say it. You're in or you're in the way. And those guys, and the thing is with Mark and Dale, they really know hockey and they know players. So they don't, they know like that they, if they, if they push game to shove, they can find another you for sure. Mark has a great eye for talent and Dale has a great coach. You can see who's going to help his, you know, philosophies. So they're really smart hockey people. So they're, you know, they're never really back into the corner. They give them players. They are literally the type of organization that's given players a very good opportunity to step into a role and show NHL people what they can do in that role. Cause Dale runs the bench, in my opinion, exactly the way the NHL is played. And that's what the, the thing is. Dale's, he sees the game very well. So he starts changing his structures towards the way the NHL is. They watch a ton of NHL. So he's trying to mold NHL players. And if you get to London, you get a chance to play there. They're going to put you in a role where they see, they think they can see you playing the NHL. So, as you probably know, the Oilers recently fired their GM, Peter Chiarelli, and one name that's come up through media fan speculation is to replace Chiarelli in the GM role is Mark Hunter. Do you like? Do you think he yeah. could translate the level of success he's seen in the OHL with London, which is just like unbelievable, like how good they've been consistently since he's been there, to an NHL organization like Edmonton? I think Mark is a, I think, Mark, in my opinion, Mark Hunter is a, is a, is a genius, like a hockey genius. And um, I think it's important that he has his word. His I think his word needs to be the most powerful one in the room because he's right. He watches. And that's the thing. When, when Mark has an opinion on something, it's because he's seen it. And he understands it. It's not a guess. It's not a, a job protection comment. He says it how he means it. And that's, that's I think that's good. I think very bluntly, he's honest, and he come. I remember we played in London. He come down the room, and when you were playing like shit, he let you know that's not good enough, Shrimpy. Not good enough. He'd walk by and just say that's horse shit. And you, and it, it was like you're every time he did that, he was right. If okay, if you're a player that can take honesty, he was right. If you're a player that wants to get mad because GM came down and said something to you, then you're. I don't think you're right. Like when Mark came down and told you you're playing like shit, you were. And it'd be wise for you to take a look in the mirror and change your ways. So he was on it. Like, he knows the beat. He knows the beat of the team. He knows the beat of the players. He knows he knows a lot because he watches and he loves it. That's what he loves to do. He, could, he doesn't need to be doing this. He could literally, I mean, they're doing well in London. He could he could relax. But he loves hockey that much. So I give a lot, my, a lot of respect to Mark and Dale, and I think a lot of them. I, I don't want to put a ton of pressure on him if he does get the Edmonton job. Not that I am, but I, I think highly of him. That's my opinion of Mark Hunter. And I think he would do great things anywhere he goes. He was really good in uh, Toronto in the short time he had there, and he's been uh, you know, over the last 15 years in London, he's killed it. He's done very good in the market. That's tough. These are kids that are 16 to 20, so your windows are a lot smaller to be right on guys. As as we're since we're talking about management, what qualities as like a guy like yourself that's been a pro player for so long, what qualities in a manager are important? As fans, we don't get to see the ins and outs of what's going on with organizations, but as somebody who's talked to these guys, who's dealt with them, what qualities do you think would be important for like a team like the Oilers that's looking like for a new manager? What qualities in a manager would be important for them to bring in? Uh, I think important. It's very important the general manager's vision for the players, and he needs to say that to the players. Not my my opinion. Okay, don't I, don't get me wrong, and I don't think that I'm any better than anybody. I'm not. I'm just saying what I think. So I would just think that the the GM would portray what his vision is with the team to the team to the players. Let them know how they all fit into that puzzle and how to be the best in their space. If you give these people guidance and you give them spaces. Here's your space. Be the best in this space. If a, if a GM can do that, I don't know. Maybe that's a coach's job. I don't know. But I'm just saying, if each person in the organization knows not only hockey players, but everybody. Everybody has a piece in it. You know, the, to the experience at the London Knights hockey game, it's not just because Mark and Dale are smart with the hockey. They also know how to put on a show. Like, they're entertaining people. As businessmen, take him away from the how brilliant I think is the hockey guy. Now take him as a businessman. Think about the show they put on in London. 
It's unbelievable. 9,100 every night for the last 15 I mean, it's a great show. They got in-between sh- um, intermission shows. Everybody knows their place in the organization, and that's smart. That's a general manager. You manage everything. How do we make sales? How do we make entertainment? How do we make a great product on the ice? They have the ability to do all that. So they're a very special talent, uh, the Hunter Brothers. I want to change gears for a quick second because Rob, you and I are actually pretty close to the same age. And one thing that sticks out to me about you was there was a time when the Oilers rookies were playing against the Golden Bears and they were doing a little shootout drills or whatever after the game. And you pulled off one of those lacrosse style goals where you picked it up on the puck up on your stick from the, from the red line, walked it in and did like some of the craziest shit I had ever seen at that point. My question for you is now you can go on Instagram and you can kind of see like a 10 year old, a nine year old doing that on their backyard rink. Does that kind of thing blow you away? The kind of puck skills that kids have relative to kind of when you grew up? Cause like I said, I remember seeing the lacrosse style move you pulled and never having seen that before. And now you can go see a 10 year old on Instagram ripping around doing the same kind of thing. Yeah, it's pretty unique. I think it's great. You know, I think it's creativity. I love it. I love the creativity. That's truly what I enjoy most about about all the sports, the creative side of it. How can you be creative? Okay, everybody can swing the bat. Everybody can throw the ball. Everybody can shoot the puck. How can you now do all those things to a certain level and then also make that thing entertaining for someone else to watch? So it's, it's entertainment value is huge in sports. And that's, it goes, it's part of being having charisma as an athlete is knowing how that you're an entertainer. At the end of the day, if, if you go out and everybody does everything the same, that's going to be boring. You're not going to have people to come watch that because people are going to get bored of it. So it's all about entertaining and having something unique. So uh, to have those kids kind of opening up at a young age is a lot. You know, I love to see it. It's great. I think it's cool. I think it's the kids showing that they're not just, you know, <laughs> you know, little robots. They have creativity. They have curiosities. And they want to do things that are different. That's, I think that's special. It, it should also be part of the game. I think there's a lot of discipline in the game, but you also got to have some creativity. It's not... Uh, straight lines are not always the greatest my opinion for you where did that come from like for for you to work on those hands and those kind of moves were you the kind of were you the kind of kid that was sitting in the basement just kind of working your hands all the time like where did that come from for you i mean i was like from the time i was 10 years old to 15 i spent i mean this might sound crazy but i mean i spent literally like eight to nine hours a day at the rink every day every day literally i just did like random things like I played the cross in the summertime so I was playing the cross and I remember stick hand on the ball and I was like man you can do this with the puck and I remember Mike seeing Mike Legg's little highlight thing where he did a pick it up so my cousin taught me how to pick it up and then after that I started playing the cross I'm like well I can I think I can play the cross with the hockey stick in a puck and I just started doing it and then it worked I was like oh that's cool and then everybody else was like what the hell and I was like okay I guess this is a little bit different you know and then it just kind of caught on. It was kind of my thing. But I don't know. It was just fun for me. It was like mixing two sports. Like I said, I was just being creative. I played the cross, played hockey. I just was out there one day. It was like, hey, shit, I think you're going to cross, cradle a hockey puck with a hockey stick. Let me try it. And it worked. Then I was like obsessed with it. It was so cool. Um, and it, yeah, it worked. It was fun to do. It just, it's fun for me. Now going out and just regularly stick handling is no longer fun because I had this curiosity of mine and I end up doing it. And now I'm obsessed with it. You know what I mean? Yeah. So I would do it all the time. And then sometimes people would be like, Oh, you cocky, whatever, like you hot dog. And I'm like, well, this has just become my new reality of stick handle. I can now stick handle like a lacrosse stick. Why would I not do it? Yeah, sure. So much fun. But then some people take it wrong. I mean, it really did. It It got me this label of like cocky and like, I don't know, uncontrollable, I suppose. But it's a matter of jealousy, right? Though, like you see, you have kids that have no idea how you're doing what you're doing. I remember like, like I said, you and I are roughly the same age. And I remember seeing, I was still playing at the time when I saw you doing that shit with lacrosse style. And I'm just like, I don't know. The game's over. (laughs) You, You mentioned playing lacrosse as a kid. What do you think about kids now? Like I notice... Uh, we're starting to get towards the springtime where a lot of hockey schools are being pumped out. What do you think about kids very, very specialized in hockey alone as opposed to playing hockey and lacrosse or maybe baseball or whatever else that you got up to? What do you think about the specialization of sports for kids? I don't know. I, I don't mind. I don't mind if that's what you want to do. If the kids want to do it, um, I am whatever the kid, like the individual wants to do. I, I played hockey. I played every sport until I was like 11. And then I got obsessed with hockey. I was like, I just want to play hockey. Um, I 
I had some good, you know, whatever. I, I, I was okay. I was pretty good at lacrosse, pretty good at baseball, but then hockey was like, it was just my, I enjoyed it the most. So we jumped on that board and that was my decision. So then I would play like, in the summertime, I would play like 20 tournaments. I played two tournaments a weekend sometimes with like two different teams. And that's my, I loved it. I was obsessed. So there was no like, I mean, we had no future plans with, when I was doing that. That was just what I wanted to do. Uh, having four kids, my family loved it because I could go away on a weekend with other hockey families. And it was great. It was one kid out of the, out of the house. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, they have, you know, there's six of us in a family. We're living in not a big house. So, you know, that can't, and that, they were pumped. And I was also getting out to see things. I was going to Montreal, Canada. I was going to Ottawa, Canada, seeing a little bit of the world and, and also playing hockey. So it was a very cool thing. And it, that was my experience. It was never forced, and it was never, it was never like, hey, Tommy down the streets skating 300 days a year. I better skate 301. I didn't give a shit what Tommy down the street was doing. I was just going out and having fun myself. So now that you're finished playing pro, I mean, <clears throat> you talked about the pressure of being on the one-year deals and this and that and always looking for the next job. Now that you're finished and you can just go back to playing hockey for the hell of it, just to have fun, how refreshing is that? Uh, I've really, uh, I've like a big weight vest off my chest. So you're playing, I, I played, I jumped, I jumped on a men's league team and I, I just, I don't even, I felt bad as I retired again. <laughs> the guys are like, no, oh, we pushed you in retirement. I'm not, I just, I want to walk away from the game a little bit. And I'm more focused on, like we talked about in the beginning with beta sport and building a, pr- a pretty cool vision for the future with other people and helping other people taking, like I'm speaking candid in this interview, but like, I'm just telling you how I feel and how I'm going to try to change things and help other people through my experiences. So that's really where my passion is right now. And it's not towards hockey. I, I gave hockey a great go. I uh, had a lot of fun in it, met a lot of great people. Um, it was really, it was, I mean, I had some ups and downs, a lot of downs, but it taught me to be tough skinned and keep my shit together and a little bit of discipline. And you know, I've landed in a good spot here with Veda sport. I have a good crew around me. I'm really excited about this team. So um, everything happens. You know, I tell you the deep stories, but like, I'm still standing here. I'm still okay. And that's the message. I had big depression. I've had anxiety issues. I've fought some pretty good fights. I've kind of made my career was shaped in a way that I didn't see happening. Other people didn't see happening, but everything happens and I'm good. I'm still standing here, even through all the controversy. Still love life. Ready to go. Every day is blessed. Love it. Well, it's great to hear that you got into that spot. You know what I mean? It's, it sounds like there's been a lot of challenges that you want to walk through and that you've gotten through to this point. And we can't thank you enough for being as candid as you have in this interview. Um, and but I want to end things off by talking about Veda a little bit more and what's coming next. What's next for Veda Sport? What are you guys working on? Um, what are you pushing to achieve? And how can we help use our platform to get you there? Well, yeah, Veda is great. We're using we like I said, we have the NWHL, so we're really using those girls also with their testimony to you know just to show people that these high end athletes are okay taking and stuff, and it helps them as well. The big thing is not about for us is. Whenever we give it to someone, we want that to, to help them, okay? That's the most important thing. It's not about making sure everybody's saying, I take VEDA. That's not what we're looking to do. We're looking to actually, actually have an impact in the world. And the company that I'm, is behind VEDA, is their big mission and is to reintroduce hemp back into the farming system through, you know, through dairy, through protein. Um, so we're back to being balanced in our food. Um, the endocannabinoids in our body, you know, that system's being balanced out. That's our big vision. So... We have a bigger picture view with the company, the big company. Beta Sport, we're trying to get it to the athletes and get it, like I mentioned before, so like opioids are a big deal and they are an issue. Sleepers are an issue. These kind of things we'd like to, we're not trying to, uh, some people need those things, but if you had alternatives like we do, that, like I mentioned, are, are natural, sustainable, and they hit home to all the things that you need them to, like sleep, like pain, inflammation, I think it's just a better ride, my opinion. And where and where can people get some more information if they're if they're looking to check out Veda Sport? Yeah, sorry, VedaSport dot uh, dot pro. www dot VedaSport dot pro is uh, the website, and then also www dot VedaECN dot com would be the wellness stuff. So there's two websites there. You really go on there to get educated. There's a great website there. There's also like a drug interaction um, application on there. So if you're ever taking any medicine, you want to know if you can take it with CBD. It's right there as well, which is very cool. Not many other people are doing that. We want people to feel comfortable. And like I said, we're in the education process. So that's that's very educational for people to know what they can take and what they can't take if they can with us. So uh, have that 
if they don't have to go to a doctor, now, they can go right on the bed. It's a medical doctor uh, back check, um, pill checker or medicine checker. And lastly, the last thing I want to, to touch on is you were talking about uh, advocating for mental health. Uh, is there any websites or places that people can go to check out some of that information that you were talking about as well? We're building right now, Fight Like Me, we're building the, um, whatever you want to call it, the brand marketing of it to figure out what that wants to look like. So we don't have that up yet going. I wish I did, but uh, we're just starting the conversation. As I said, we're a startup. So the foundation is going to be kind of filtered through with sales from Beta Sport, and that's Something also why I want to get the initiative going with Beta Sports. So one dollar for each sale, I believe, is going to the foundation, and that'll help run initiatives with the foundation or whatever, so to speak. Um, also, like I said, meet, looking to meet up with other um, foundations that um, we can collaborate with and maybe have some partnerships with. So it's all about meet, uh, meeting people and each having the same message of helping other people. That's really where we're at. And uh, like I, the fight, the fight like me, we're just trying to build it up slowly. So like I said, I, we're not ready to launch per se, but I just want to get the word out even now while I have these opportunities with your platform. I really appreciate this, um, having me on and, and give me the chance to, to have uh, the ability to reach other people with my story and also with maybe uh, CBD. Well, how's this like when, when fight like me gets going and you guys are ready to go, maybe you can, uh, we'll pop back on together and we can launch this and we can help promote it through our, through our platform. So I just want to say thank you from all of us for giving us uh, half an hour of your time here talking about Veda Sport, talking about your journey through hockey, and uh, really appreciate your openness to the questions and just kind of hanging out for a little bit. Uh, no problem, guys. I really appreciate your uh, your call, having me on, uh, interest in even talking to me. I really appreciate it. And uh, thanks for giving me the platform to speak about Veda Sport and as well as mental health. So. Uh, anytime you guys want me back on, I'm more than willing to. I love talking with you guys. I appreciate your time. Thanks, Rob. Appreciate it, buddy. Take care, guys. Thank you. Want to thank, as always, our friends at Sherwood Ford the Giant. Give them a follow on Twitter at Sherwood Ford and give them a follow on Instagram at Sherwood Ford underscore the Giant. Make sure you are following Jay around, taking pictures of his truck, hashtagging it with Nation Truck. You could be entered to win a $100 gas card. I also want to give a shout out to our friends at Get Sauced. Every Monday on Inside the Nation over on our Facebook page, we are giving away a three-pack of Get Sauced sauces. You're going to want to spice up your life. You want as much flavor in your mouth as Chris has on a daily basis, right? Yeah. That was good. Wait, that was good input. <laughs> <laughs> I'm really glad you cut to Chris on that one. <laughs> what does that even lot. mean? He gave you a lot to work with. Yeah. That was good. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> He's yeah. softly panting in the corner. Chris is sauced right now. That's, so, boys. I got sauced. I want to commend all of you yeah. for the interview we just had with Mr. Rob Shrimp. That was, a, uh, that was a cool conversation with a dude that I don't know if I ever would have expected to talk to. Um, but he was very open and candid and I thought he gave a lot of interesting answers on his experience in hockey and what he's doing now. And I'm just curious what you guys thought. I so badly want him to play on my beer league team. I cannot stress enough how I want me and Rob Shrimp on the top line. And I stress not just Rob Shrimp, but me also on the top line, just dummy and guys. He's doing lacrosse move. I'm driving the net, scoring all kinds of goals. I'm having a great time. That's now what I'm going to be thinking about all weekend. As if you could keep up with Rob Shrimp. Buddy, you know that I have great wheels. I might not have great hands, and I think Robbie Shrimp and I would be a great beer league duo. He's just passing him the puck from inside the blue line and skating with him, trying to keep up. <laughs> like my head down's going hard to the net. I'm picking up as many assists on all of Robbie Shrimp's goals as I possibly can. You would Second be the assist. Milan Lucic to Conor McDavid uh, as Cam to wow. Rob Shrimp. So, so I have to say, you guys, uh, myself and Rick, we were we were sitting in on this uh, this interview, and I think you guys did a great job. I think Rob gave you guys a lot of uh, really really interesting answers uh rick you uh yeah he's really candid i uh i'm not sure exactly what i expected to hear um but just sitting down and listening to him i think he's uh pretty open with the things he's going through and you know he said that it's pretty new to him so being that open this early in the in the situation you gotta give the guy a pat on the back and then uh, well done i think that's something that uh the on radio podcast will just keep doing we're gonna keep bringing the guests that you'd never expect to hear you're gonna hear that you're gonna hear from the greats like George the Rock, but you're also gonna hear from the guys like uh, like Rob Shrimp that we had a lot of a lot of history and a lot of hope in, and uh, you know, things happen. I think Shrimp had he had a good story to tell that I think Oilers fans need to hear because there's a lot of there's a lot of thoughts towards him that people don't know his 
uh, background story and what he suffers through. And I think it was, uh, it was good for him to talk about it. And that's a good point too. I think that we, uh, we now live in, a, in an age where everybody knows everything about everyone and, and we all have access to social media and we have access to everybody in an instant. And I think that there was, there was probably something to that. Um, you know, Rob, uh, Rob had a lot of time in uh, London where maybe people thought he was a, a stuck up guy or whatever. And, and that's just not the case. So yeah, it's a, uh, it was, it was a really good interview by you guys. Great job. I just thought it was interesting how basically from the time he was drafted by the golden or by not the golden Knights, they didn't exist Dan. <laughs> by, by the golden the, by the London Knights up until the time when he retired last year, playing in the Austrian league that it was a battle for him. It was always, nothing was really easy for the guy. Um, he struggled for everything he got he powered through. And he pushed until he couldn't anymore. And I thought the the journey that he talked about and that he shared with us is pretty interesting. And like Chris said, something that I don't know how many people would have known otherwise. Yep. No, for sure. And hopefully, hopefully we can convince him to come back again. Yeah. You know what I mean? I thought that uh, his thoughts on what's going on in London, how they run their program, what kind of uh, person a GM should be kind of thing. Um, I thought that was super interesting. I thought he had kind of inside takes that us as fans wouldn't normally have a chance to really think about. And uh, I'm pretty grateful for his time. He was a good dude, good conversation, happy to have him. And uh, it's a good interview by everybody. A lot of questions coming in. We have a shared doc. So to pull you guys behind the curtain on this, we all have a kind of like a Google Sheet open when we're doing these. And we're all kind of sending ideas around. We're all trying to give each other visual cues um, to make sure that we know who's coming next with a question or whatever. One thing we learned from the George LaRock interview, I think, was that we were a little bit scattered in terms of our internal communication on who's asking what and when. And I think today we did a lot better job of that. Would you agree, Cam? Yeah, I agree. We, uh, we're communicating. We, we put our hands up. <laughs> who was going to ask the next question like we're in a classroom it'll be odd though that. it'll be interesting when we have somebody in the room <laughs> and we're still and we're just like hands putting our hands up like <laughs> they're just so confused by us yeah i know it's uh it was good it was good it was a lot of fun it's gonna be real weird when we have somebody in the room and we're all just like got like a big open mouth smile and we're just staring at them <laughs> like we got chris over there making his well and and, and, I, and I think that's something too that that uh maybe it gets lost because we're behind the microphone but we are just fans of these guys and and you know myself i i was a huge rob shrimp fan back in the day and i had a lot of hope for him and uh yeah it's just the same thing with george rock cam that's your that's your absolute favorite player of all my time. first favorite player got yeah. his jersey got it signed signed so, my jersey when i was nine and then i got to interview him on a podcast at the age of 25 very cool yeah yeah so oilers talk <laughs> <laughs> like that transition. Wow, that wow. was a hell of a segue. That was a <laughs> Oilers talk segue well, like I've never answer. seen before. Chris, I is was expecting everyone to look at me so intently when I <laughs> inhaled, turning into the master of segues. So, because Chris has requested some Oilers talk, let's get into it. Okay, thoughts. Hughes. Shrimp done. Hughes, really good. Rob Shrimp interview done. Oilers talk engaged. Okay, so how about them Oilers? Okay, Chris, let's start off. Let's how about them, Oilers? Thoughts? Things have not been going well, my friend. They're still not good. We're getting closer and closer to uh, the lottery pick, which is exciting, like being in the run for a lottery pick. Let's talk about that for real quick. We're oh. in year four of Connor McDavid's career. I never in a million years would have expected ever to be in lottery contention again. I remember very clearly at the Connor McDavid draft party that we threw where... His name was called Rick, who's sitting behind me, hands me a shot of Jack Daniels. We cheersed and we said, things are going to be different. <laughs> Good times. Here well, we are. Now we are within six points of being dead last in the NHL, looking at the lose for Hughes kind of idea of another draft lottery. Where are you guys at in terms of tanking? Are you wanting the tank? Are you not wanting it? Cam, I'll start with you. Can you believe that nine years after fall for Hall, we're saying lose for Hughes? Like we were watching Taylor Hall and Mem Cup and we're all like, oh, fuck yeah, this is the guy. But actually just wait nine more years. There's a nine-year-old right now from Florida. That's going to be the guy. But no, I'm actually as sad and depressing as it is. When I saw that there were six points out of a playoff spot and six points up on last and they were right in that middle spot, I thought, time to tank again. There's no way they're acquiring elite level talent without tanking. That's what they need. 
they need more good players, and that's the only way they're going to get them. I'm at a, I'm still at a game by game basis. So right now, I'm like, all right, if the Oilers win tonight, then like, okay, we're back in the playoff race. But if they lose, then I'm like, okay, we're 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 going for the lottery pick. And then in another day, I'll be the exact same situation, just waiting on the other game. And if the next game they win, then I'm going to be back in a playoff race and uh, so on and so forth. It, yeah, it's been, a, it's been a struggle. I mean, we're with it, we're in the fight for the last playoff spot, which I think everybody would have said where this team is expected to be at this time of year. Although, on the other hand, that playoff spot is much lower than what everyone expected it to be. So it kind of, it kind of looks kind of weird. And that's why we're so close to being last place, too, because the whole West turtle race here is ridiculous it's making it look really really bad but uh this is really bad for radio but i'm so tired of arguing with the team this is a hundred percent on that stupid gm we just got rid of (laughs) who's put us in this position who was gifted connor who was gifted all these this incredible talent when he got here and he shit the bed with it he just he pissed a lot of it away he brought nothing in return and we are where we are because 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 of what Pete did to us. I mean, I don't want to see that guy in the damn city ever again. They're in a worse spot now than when Trelli inherited the team. Yeah, no, and I, I so so to um to Rick what Rick was saying and I, and I still I believe hope will never die. I I live that way. Yeah. Nationgear.ca. <laughs> and uh and so, you know, when Hitchcock says that we just need four points out of every three games. That's that's a, you know, that's a it's I mean, it's a ridiculously hard thing to do the way the team has been playing but the team played well against pittsburgh that's one of the better teams in the league yes they've been struggling recently but uh you know i mean there's there's still hope there's always hope when you have Connor mcdavid on your team and so so i respect ken hitchcock a lot maybe he's lost the room i don't know but uh he's still speaking to me and and there's there's still a chance there's still a chance at least we're going to have, we're guaranteed, uh, hopefully, a long Bakersfield Condors playoff run that we can all tune into. Okay. At least well, the Condors are rolling. And you, yeah. And you all just right. damned that, Chris. No. <laughs> yeah. I, I shouldn't have said guaranteed. Condors talk. They're actually, uh, they're four games away now from tying the record for the longest AHL winning streak of all time. Man, we've come a long way from splitting an AHL team with like nine other franchises. Do yes. We now have, <laughs> there's another Rob Shrimp tie-in. Because <laughs> that poor guy had yeah, because he got that. Those were the days I remember when Dubnik was the backup goalie with nope. Wilkes Bar Scranton or wherever the fuck, nope. and he just didn't play because like they didn't have an AHL team. And they were like, "Oh, maybe we should have an AHL team. Yeah. AHL team. Oh, that would be good for development. Oh, maybe we should probably get one. I yeah. guess this thing of not having one isn't really going to work. Well, maybe we should look at having one. Well, maybe we should look at having another <laughs> one." Hey Pittsburgh, do you want to like stunt the development of your goalie so that we can play our goalie too? Well, how, how about that? So I want to welcome all of you to episode one of Condors Nation Radio. <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> I asked this question. I asked this question yesterday in the office. Would you rather play for the Bakersfield Condors right now or the Edmonton Oilers? Well, monetarily, I would say the Edmonton Oilers because okay. ka-ching. However, if you're a guy like um, Jesse Pooley-Arvey. Great segue. You should be in the AHL because it'd be beneficial to have winning you know, a winning environment surrounding you, maybe a little offensive confidence. You'd be paying 20, 25 minutes in all situations on a top line, yeah. on a top line. Whereas you have a guy who's older than you and Tyler Benson, he's down there and he's doing well. You have a guy four months younger than you and Kaylor Yamamoto. He's down there and he's building confidence. Why is Jesse pooley not in there? Cameron? I don't really understand. pooley could technically right now still be playing major junior in Canada, but the Oilers are just like, you are an NHL veteran and you should play like one. So I'm going to talk about that. The other day I was getting mad online. I wasn't really mad, but I was pretending you, to be mad. You online. appeared to be quite mad. <laughs> yeah. Well, th- then that's the funny thing about Twitter, right? Is if you could hear me say the jokes that I was saying, you would understand the cadence is like, I'm not actually mad, but the idea that Jesse Pugliarvi, whom Cam said can still technically be in junior is struggling and people think he's a bust is just, it doesn't make sense to me. It doesn't make sense to me why the organization doesn't see it as a problem that he should be with guys his age winning in Bakersfield instead of dragging balls on the fourth line in Edmonton right now. Like, it doesn't make any sense. You could bring up, you know... Um, Patrick Russell. Patrick Russell could fill in admirably in that role that Jesse's playing. Jesse could go down and get some confidence. And 
it would be better in the long term. And I think something too to, to the because you were kind of mentioning it in your uh, your tweets there, Bag Milk is just it's frustrating for us as fans to watch him get get projected to be on that second line, and he starts on that second line, and then two shifts later he's down on the fourth line, and that's frustrating for fans. But I can't imagine being a twenty year old kid and that not a frustrating you, b confusing the hell out of you. And see, just hurting your hurting your overall confidence and I, as it goes. I get the optics of it. Like there's, it's hard to watch Puliyarvi struggle when there are other twenty year olds, nineteen year olds, eighteen year olds coming in the league and just like blowing everything up. Elias Pettersson, example number one. Uh, so you kind of want to expect the same out of your own guys, but everyone's different. Jesse Puliyarvi can't be expected to produce at that level. Um, and frankly, no 19, 20 year old should be expected to produce at that level. But like the NHL is moving to such a young age um, where all the good players are a younger age. So it's I get why people are frustrated, but we got to give them a, some And slack. then we're also we're going to do it again with the next guy, right? Like we just yeah. talked about how important it is for the others to acquire elite talent. With the draft, they're going to pick seventh overall this year and everyone's going to be like, we need to put X player born in 2001 on the second line because these are fourth best forward already. We aren't. There is a culture change. I can sense it. I said it last week. They are starting to smarten up right now. Uh, I think it's Speck had a, uh, an interview with Keith Gretzky yesterday where Keith was, you know, he's talking about keeping those guys down there and moving out some dead money and some dead weight realistically. And so that just that interview right there gave me a, a, a another boost of uh, optimism and knowing that that's what he's looking at right now, that I mean, that means what's what all the old boys club or whatever everybody wants to call it is that they're all thinking the same way right now. We're coming in with a new guy. Things are going to be done properly now. Bouchard went back down last year as he should have been. And next year, he's going to be in the AHL. He's not going to make the NHL. There's no way he takes the NHL. There's no... Unless uh. he comes in and wins the spot. <laughs> unless he wins the spot. And I, even then, I don't think they're going to... I think they're going to put him down. They're going to do things properly. So unless he comes up and proves that he can play 18 minutes as the second pairing guy, there's no chance. I'm just ready for it to be late June and sixth overall, the Oilers roll up and they're like, we select from the United States Development Program, Trevor Zegras, who is apparently a skilled center. And then everyone in the media is all of a sudden just like, well, that means now we can trade Nugent Hopkins for a second pairing defenseman like we need. And this Trevor Zegras is ready to jump in because an 18 year old and 18 year olds are good. And that just seems like that's what I'm ready for as an Edmonton Oilers fan. Well, it, and it's interesting to me too, because as I was arguing with morons, in my opinion, Ooh. Uh, <laughs> alleged morons, in your alleged opinion. morons, in my opinion, um, they, the interesting thing is, well, he hasn't done anything. So he's a bust. Or Kokit Niemi or Kokanen Niemi and Montreal is 18 and he <laughs> is already doing stuff. Development isn't a straight line. People aren't the same. You've got a 20-year-old from northern Finland who doesn't speak a whole lot of the language. The team didn't do him any favors by not giving him a tutor. They didn't give him any favors by not making him live with another Finn. They didn't do any favors by putting him in the AHL where he could have shone over the last three years. To me... Jesse Pugliarvi shouldn't have had any NHL games on his roster until maybe this year. He should have spent his first post-draft year in Europe, then a full year in the AHL, and then this is the year they could have considered calling him up. That would have been the right thing to do. That would be what a smart team would do. And what I just don't understand is why Oilers fans just can't seem to like look at what other teams do with their development and kind of realize that what we're doing and have done is wrong. It's just it doesn't work. And you're forcing kids to fight above their weight class when they're not ready and you're ruining their confidence. Well, you can't track confidence on a spreadsheet bag milk. Well, yeah. Okay, fine. But if you're pretending like a 20 year old kid who is got all kinds of pressure on him to perform and he's not doing it in eight minutes of ice time, that's going to ruin him. It's going to ruin him. Well, pulley RVs like Yakupov bag milk. Yeah, no, he's not. No, he's not. The handling of them is maybe the same. But he's not. Jesse Pugliarvi is already defensively aware. He, Yeah, he's making mistakes because I'm guessing he's scared of touching the puck, period, full stop. He's making weird plays because he knows if he makes one mistake, he's going off the line with Nuge and Kara down to the fourth line. Or even if he doesn't make a mistake, he's going down to the fourth line. I don't understand how a guy is supposed to thrive in an environment where that's what you're doing. Doesn't make sense. Nope. Doesn't make sense. Speaking of uh, the Oilers, 
Andre Sakara got a two-game extension with the Bakersfield Condors. He is down on a conditioning stint. The Oilers applied for the two-game extension, so he will be playing five games down there, which buys him a little extra time to clear the cap space required. Sounds a lot like it's going to be Cam Talbot going to a team like Philly. Whether you like it or not, I'm curious. I'm going to go around the horn, see what everybody thinks of the rumored Talbot for Elliott trade. Uh, Carter Hart is apparently Cam Talbot's protege. They spend a lot of time together in the offseason working together, and Carter Hart talked about yesterday how great of a guy Talbot is. I can see why Philly would want him. I don't understand why Edmonton would want Elliott back outside of cap savings. What do you guys think on this? Would you rather trade Koskinen for Carter Hart and have what? Talbot and Hart. What? No, no, no. People yeah, are speculating. What if it was reversed? Yeah, no, let's call, so, call absolutely Philly do. right now. Let's get now. this. Let's get this so going. what if they trade Cosk? What if everyone's wrong and they're actually looking to trade Koskin and for Carter Hart? So we have a Talbot Hart duo in Edmonton instead of Talbot for Elliot. That makes no sense on Philadelphia. Are we also side. getting no, we're it, this, it we're get, coffee cup? We're going to get there. gritty yeah, back in return. I don't know what's in that coffee cup, but that's never happening. It's just saying. It's just. You know, it's good for Talbot. It'll be good for him. Wherever he goes, the defense in front of him will be improved. He will have a playoff chance to go to. Uh, playoff chance. Uh, playoff. Yeah, struggling through puberty. He'll have a chance to play in the playoffs, where he's where he's excelled in the past. And, Wait, where's uh, this in Philly? Yeah, perhaps. No. Moni? No. Flyers are bad. No, no. Flyers are like Oilers East. They're on a playoff push right now. But they're yeah, but they're the they're Oilers are only up. six points out of a playoff spot. The Flyers <laughs> are trending up, so he has a, he has a chance to go there and succeed. I think the thing that is frustrating for Oilers fans is that you may only get uh, Brian Elliott back, and that's and that's pretty depressing because you're not even getting an asset out of a guy. That- all you're getting is cap space. We all know why we're in this <laughs> in this in this position. Say it again, Rick. Damn it, Peter. <laughs> <laughs> like that guy has left us in such a what a horrible, legacy in such a horrible position like I mean, you're moving out guys that you don't really want to move out just to make enough money to bring you know, it's it's honestly i, I want to pull my hair out i don't know why he was allowed to do this for the last year if they just got rid of him last summer then think of how much better we'd be yep Rain or right now, Rick's veins are just oh, bursting I, out of his is, face. Uh, honestly, it, his it, arms eats, are flexing. it eats me. It eats me up inside. Like this is how did we? Why did we let this guy do this for one more year? He's never done anything good before. He lucked out on the maroon trade. He lucked out on the uh, Cassian trade. He was given Connor. So what was the best thing he did? Sign Connor for eight years. We all said that was pretty much paint by numbers too. It's like here's a check and we want eight years. You want eight years? Just fill out the fucking check it's funny every oilers conversation topic leads back to trelly screwing us over well how can it not though it's like you have no cap space you're one of the top paying nhl teams right now in terms of dollars spent on players you look at middling farm system too and yeah and you and now we're talking about there's still media in this city talking about whether the oilers should try and trade assets to bring in somebody to get cover those six points needed until a playoff spot it doesn't make any sense to me doesn't make any sense to me. To me, the approach is clear out dead weight as much as you possibly can, free up cap space to head into the draft and into the. You've got to be patient. You cannot. You cannot fix this mess quickly. You're not just going to snap your fingers and all of a sudden Torelli's dipshit moves are finished. It's going to take a couple of years. You got to let these things ride out. You got to draft. You got to develop. It's going to take time. To be fair, I think these guys that are talking about trying to maybe bring somebody in aren't talking like a rental. They're not looking at a chieson for that matter they're talking about someone who's got some term on it on his contract two three years and we can help build off that for next year um i don't yeah if there if that trade was out there i'd definitely consider it uh i don't think we have to sit here and sell well you can't really sell off anything because we have nothing to fucking sell but yeah no I, if you can get if you can bring in uh an asset right now then you do it like what's the point in waiting if you can bring in someone that's gonna help you for a couple years jump on it right now and i don't think anyone's bringing in a, a two-month rental we are the worst garage sale ever. Well, we're going to wrap up this podcast. I want to real, real quickly at the Milan Lucic goal draft. We are through the first three games of Chris week. You have got no goals, my friend. Last week on this very podcast, you talked about how there was no chance you wanted to pool our games against Cam because you were going to pick up some ground this week. You have not done that. You've got tonight's game against Carolina. 
Coombe is back in the mix tomorrow against the Islanders. Have you changed your opinion? I I don't think I can change my opinion. There's no, there's no, there's no I, turning back. I will not admit defeat. February is still my month. It's still my month to pull through and catch up, and I'm. Uh, we'll talk again at the end of February. I can't hear you all the way up here at one goal. Cam, all <laughs> I'm saying it. is you've wasted an opportunity. I think I might go to Dan and Rick, and we may do a side bet without Chris because no, last week I don't. I'm not accepting a bet with Chris involved. You guys oh. have to keep Chris out of the picture. Oh. I think Chris was too cocky. He thought he had a big dick because he had all these games in February. I didn't like it. I didn't like how he was talking down to everybody. I thought it was disrespectful. And rude. So <laughs> it's I wanna... literally we're literally halfway through the month. If you guys try and do a double days. or nothing deal with Chris in the mix, I say no. I want to thank our friends at Sherwood Ford the Giant. Go follow them on social media. I want to thank Get Sauce for helping us out. I want to thank Rob Shrimp for coming and hanging out with us for 30 minutes via the phone. And I want to thank Tyron for the double kick drum. And the screaming that is filling my ears up. I love it. Thank you, everybody, for listening. Please share. Please tell a friend. Please tell a coworker. Please tell a cousin. Listen to Oilers Nation Radio. Shout out, Damien. Thanks, Christian.